Welcome on this frigid day. <coughs> Yay, Iowa. Look, you know what you're in for here. So it's not like this is a surprise, right? When it gets down like 10 below. Oh, yeah. We were talking the other day about comparing stories about how low they've seen the thermometer in their car in the past. And I think the record was like minus, I think you had the record. Below. Minus 30, geez. And we were like, how do, do cars must go that low? I don't know how low they go, but. <laughs> Um, so it could be worse, right? It could be 35 below. Speaking of things could be worse, <laughs> let's talk about 2 Samuel 17. So, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you guys tell me the story because I get up here and I, you know, I flap my gums week after week. So hopefully it's settling in. Let's do our timeline. First of all, where are we in history during this period of 2 Samuel? About 1,000 B.C. Okay, about 1,000 B.C. That's probably the right answer. So, <coughs> give or take, dates are not entirely secure. Um, one of the ways, so, this side note, how do we know when, what period we are, what year it is? Well, so we have our calendar today, the, the modern calendar, based on, you know, a 365.25 day calendar per year. Um, <coughs> It's, it's, you know, if you go and you look at what happened in 1972, you can be secure that, you know, certain things happened in 1972 because records were being kept, accurate records, and there's been no break in, in the continuum of history of, of, of writing those records. Once you get past, let's say, you know, this is 1 BC, so this is when Jesus was born. Um, it actually turns out the further back in history you go, the less secure you are. Why? Because records tend to not be kept well, war, famine, all kinds of nasty things happen, and records are lost. So the further back you get in time, the harder it is to, um, <clears throat> to determine exactly what year you're in based on the current year. One of the ways that historians actually can, can kind of reference time in the past is through astronomical events. What are some very famous or significant astronomical events that can happen that probably everyone wouldn't take note of? The Leonid asteroid. Oh, oh, okay, so uh, comets, Halo. meteors, asteroids, what else? Halley's Comet. Okay, Halley's Comet. So comets that we know the periodic <laughs> Eclipses. Of. Eclipses. It turns out eclipses scare the blank out of people. <laughs> and when they happen, they are almost always interpreted as a spiritual event. Some God or gods are unhappy and we're about to die, right? Well, they're so scary that they're almost always recorded in whatever medium of the time is recorded in. It turns out <clears throat> there was a very famous eclipse around 650 BC. And in fact, <clears throat> so this would be, I, I'm, I'm going on a tangent here, but somewhere around here, there's a very famous eclipse of the sun that happened in Assyria. It's called the Assyrian eclipse. Now. Because scientists are so good at what they do, they can predict precisely when all future eclipses, solar eclipses will happen, and all past eclipses did happen because the rotation of the Earth and the Moon and the Sun is very constant. We know the exact day that this eclipse happened in Assyria in like 650 BC. Again, I'm the ignorant one here. The, the, the year is known. <clears throat> it was recorded that a king of Assyria or a king of Nineveh at the time, so-and-so was, was ruling when this eclipse happened. Ah, this is great. Now, because we know the exact day that that eclipse happened in the past, we can say, well, that king that is referenced in this monument, on this, probably on this stone tablet, we know exactly when that king reigned. Now, suddenly, we can kind of move everything and fix it perfectly on when that guy was alive and when he was ruling and when that eclipse happened. So this is just one example of the way that we can kind of fix chronology in the past to understand it. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, there was no solar eclipse that happened in Israel during the reign of David. But if you get close and your histories are kind of connected fairly solidly, then we can kind of move things back and forth. And so we think David was ruling around 1000 BC. 763 BC. Thank you. Thank According you. to 763, you. look at you. Oh, that's it. And who was the Assyrian? Does it say who the Assyrian king was? The Assyrian eclipse, also known as the Bur Sagal eclipse, is a solar eclipse recorded in Assyrian eponym list. <laughs> Let's see, the reign of King Ashurdan III. Ashurdan, okay. Thank you. All right. On the so 15th not of June. 10th of At June. At what time? June 10th. 15th. In, June Fif what? 15th. Thank you. June 15th. In fact, um, <clears throat> 
If you suspect that this was visible in Nineveh, which would have been, <coughs> it wasn't the exact capital of, of Assyria at this point, but northern Iraq, Mosul, the modern day city of, of uh, Nineveh is Mosul, you would know exactly what time of day that that eclipse met its peak. So that's how close we can get. It's amazing that we can even do that. Um, and so now we know when that guy ruled. So thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. See, this is, a, this is a group effort. <laughs> So around 1000 BC. And if you've been through an eclipse, like we went yes. to the eclipse, it is pretty freaky out. Yeah. How many yeah. people have been in one? We had one like a couple know, years, years ago, ago yeah. or something. And we went to the. Year. No. Well, that was a. In the Midwest <laughs> is what we're talking. There's, there's usually about one per year on the Earth somewhere. I was at Verizon and Grimes. Yeah. Okay. I could tell you exactly where I was in the last oh. eclipse. So you yeah. thought of it. I mean, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. And I'm not even a Verizon customer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, being the sign seed nerds that we are, we had to drive to the exact <coughs> epicenter of where it would be complete total darkness. And it was freaky. <laughs> Has anyone else been in a total yeah. solar eclipse before? I, oh, so there's going to be another in almost exactly the same place as the previous one in a couple of years. I think it's... Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe two years, two or three years, four years from now. Um, it's actually going to go up through Texas, right through southern Illinois, which we drove mm. to, so we could get a we could get a clear shot of it, and up through I think like Indiana, Illinois, that region. I would highly recommend you take the day off from work and go do it. I know it sounds stupid, but it it is one of the most bizarre experiences I have ever had in my entire life mm. to be through a total solar eclipse. You can see when you go through that how the ancient peoples would have been terrified. And if they didn't have astronomers predicting this, which some of the cultures did, but some didn't, you would have no idea it was coming until it happened. You'd be like, oh crap, the end of the world is coming. So anyway, we've diverged. We ate up how much time there, 11 minutes? <coughs> Where are we? So this is the, <laughs> my, my daughters did this. I'm very proud of them. <laughs> I'm gonna make you guys do this. This squibble is what? <laughs> the Sea of Galilee. You can't, you know it. You gotta let them answer. Sorry. What else is it called? Chinnaroth. Ah, very good. Gold star. Chinnaroth. Galilee. <laughs> what is this? The Dead Sea. There you go. Dead Sea. I don't even know if it was called something else. Maybe the, the sea. What is this? Mediterranean. This is the Mediterranean. It's also called the Great Sea. And there are other names for it, so we don't have to get into that. Um, Gitchigumi. What is the... What's that? <laughs> Get you gummy. Get you gummy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you gummy. You're not a Gordon Lightfoot fan. No, sorry. I know. <laughs> Here's Jabus, also called Jerusalem. At this period, it is called Jerusalem because uh, it has been taken over by David. So where we're talking today in 2 Samuel is this region right here. And when we get into the narrative, I'll, I'll add some of the pieces here of where we're at. As far as the location, we are gonna, we're going to move around a little bit. Let's go ahead and start with 2 Samuel 17. Who would like to read that for me? Sure. Thank you, sir. The whole thing? Yes, 1 to 29. <laughs> it's always the whole chapter. It doesn't matter how much. <laughs> <laughs> She's not bitter. She's happy. <laughs> All right, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Ahithophel urged Absalom, let me choose 12,000 men to start out after David tonight. I will catch up with him while he is weary and discouraged. He and his troops will panic and everyone will run away. Then I will kill the only king and I will bring all the people back to you as a bride returns to her husband. After all, it is only one man's life that you seek. Then you will be at peace with all the people. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. But then Absalom said, Bring in Hushai, the mm -hmm. archite. <clears throat> Let's see what he thinks about this. When Hushai arrived, Absalom <coughs> told him what Ahithophel had said. Then he said, What is your opinion? Should we follow Ahithophel's advice? If not, what do you suggest? Hmm? Well, Hushai replied to Absalom, This time Ahithophel has made a mistake. You know your father is and his men. They are mighty warriors. Right now they are as engaged as a mother bear who has been robbed of her cubs. 
And remember that your father is an experienced man of war. He won't be spending the night among the troops. He is probably already hidden in some pit or cave. And when he comes out and attacks and a few of your men fall, there will be panic among your troops, and the word will spread that Absalom's men are being slaughtered. Then even the bravest soldiers, though they have the heart of a lion, will be paralyzed with fear. For all Israel knows what a mighty warrior your father is and how courageous his men are. <coughs> I recommend that you mobilize the entire army of Israel, bringing them from as far away as Dan in the north and Beersheba in the south. That way you will have an army as numerous as the sand on the seashore, and I advise you to personally lead the troops. When we find David, we'll fall on him like a dew that falls on the ground. Then neither he nor any of his men will be left alive. And if David were to escape into some town, you will have all Israel there at your command. Then we can take ropes and drag the walls of the town into the nearest valley until every stone is torn down. <coughs> then Absalom and all the men of Israel said Hushai's advice is better than Ahithophel's, for the Lord has determined to defeat the council of Ahithophel, which he was already the better, which really was the better plan so that he could bring disaster on Absalom. Hushai told Zadok and Abiathar the priests when Ahithophel had said to Absalom and the elders of Israel and what he himself had advised instead. Quick, he told them, find David and urge him not to stay at the shallows of the Jordan River tonight. He must go across at once into the wilderness beyond. Otherwise, he will die and his entire army with him. Jonathan and Ahimaaz had been staying with Enrogel, so as long as not to be seen entering and leaving the city. Arrangements had been made for a servant girl to bring them the message that they were to take to King David. But a boy spotted them at Enrogel, and he told Absalom about it. So they quickly escaped to Bahirium, where a man hid them down inside a <coughs> well in his courtyard. The man's wife put a cloth over the top of the well and scattered grain on top of it to dry in the sun, so no one suspected they were there. When Absalom's men arrived, they asked her, Have you seen Ahimez and Jonathan? The woman replied, They were here, but they crossed over the brook. Absalom's men looked for them without success and returned to Jerusalem. <coughs> then the two men crawled out of the well and hurried on to King David. <coughs> Quick, they told him, cross the Jordan tonight. And they told him how Ahithophel had advised that he be captured and killed. So David and all the people with him went across the Jordan River during the night, and they were all on the other bank before dawn. When Ahithophel realized that his advice had not been followed, he <coughs> saddled his donkey, went to his hometown, set his affairs in order, and hanged himself. He died there and was buried in the family tomb. David soon arrived at <coughs> Mahaniam, by now, Absalom had mobilized the entire army of Israel and was leading his troops across the Jordan River. <clears throat> Absalom had appointed Amasa as commander of his army, replacing Joab, who had been commander under David. Amasa was Joab's cousin. His father was Jether, an Ishmaelite. His mother, Abigail, daughter of Nahash, was the sister of Joab's mother, Jeruai. Absalom and the Israelite army set up camp in the land of Gilead. When David arrived at Mahaniam, he was warmly greeted by Shobi, son of Nahash, who came from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and by Mekur, son of Amiel, from Lodabar, and by Barzillai of Gilead, from Rogalim. Jeez. <laughs> Doing a great job. <laughs> I mean, it sounds good to me. I don't know if it's right. They brought sick plants, cooking pots, serving bowls, wheat and barley, flour and roasted grain, beans, lentils, honey, butter, sheep, goats, and cheese for David and those who were with them. For they said, you must all be very hungry and tired and thirsty after your long march through the wilderness. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I think one of the barriers to reading the Old Testament is this. It's, it, the, the Jews were very particular about noting family relationships, lineages, and descendants. Why were they so concerned about that? Validity. Validity. That's one. What else? 
And, for, and explain what you mean by that, like, just so I know. Well, <coughs> just that, you know, I could just throw out Brian. Yeah. Brian said, yeah. you know, Brian said this, or Brian did that. Brian who? Brian, mm -hmm. you know, son of the, mm -hmm. the Freeman clan from yeah. <laughs> wherever, <Yeah>. you know. <coughs> Freeman clan. Right. So many names. <coughs> Validity. Why else? What does it matter? And remember when this is being written and read, um, the, the writers of this did not necessarily write 2 Samuel so that, <coughs> um, assuming it was written somewhere around here, you know, 2,500 2, years later, we would be reading it in Iowa. They didn't, they didn't necessarily write it for that. What were they writing it for? Who were they writing it for? Future generations. Plus? I mean their own. Their own. Family? Yeah, it's both. Right. It's, it's, it's being legitimate to the people of their own era. And so um, one of the things, and when you get into like numbers, and, and uh, you get into things like uh, <coughs> um, the genealogies of, of First and Second Kings, your status in the society is dependent on who you can claim you are a descendant of. And so remember, there's 12 tribes of Israel at this period. Um, so 12 clans or 12 tribes. Who you descended from made a big difference in where you stood in society. If you could be a priest or not. If you could be, um, you know, uh, if you could be an aristocrat, so to speak. If you could be a king. Um, if you were an important person of society or if you were just kind of the everyone else, like me. Um, it was really important to know which family you came from, and especially when Ezra and Nehemiah and those folks come back from Babylon. Um, you know, in the in the sixth century BC and fifth century BC, it's really important that they noted exactly who was coming back and who they were related to, and it's for this reason. So I know where you stand in society. It's not like today, you know, as much in America where you kind of push the reset button on the whole strata thing, right? Um, we don't really have a, a class system in, in the United States like they do in somewhere like India or China, where depending on what family you're in, that kind of determines whether you're going to be a servant or a king your whole life. Um, <coughs> This was really important. So for us, we read all these names and they're pretty, they're pretty uh, foreign to us. Maybe David isn't. But these names are, are pretty, uh, they're pretty complicated, hard to, to understand. Let's write down who these major players are so we don't get lost here because it, you know, each one has this part to play. Who is Absalom? Third born son of David. Okay. Third son of David, thus making him what? Next in line for king. Yep, in line for kingship. Who is David then? The present king of Israel. Yep. King of Israel. King of, and I'm going to say united monarchy. Because when we say Israel, I mean, again, you guys know this. We're going to get to the period here in just a few years where they will split. And Israel will technically be the northern kingdoms. But this is now the united monarchy, all 12 tribes. Who is, okay, Ahithophel, what role is he playing here? Royal advisor. He is the royal advisor, and if you, you know, just to get review of last week, David has fled Jerusalem because his son Absalom has marched on the city in order to take over as king and essentially, um, you know, in Absalom's mind, he's probably going to have David killed so that he can take over as king of, of the whole thing. He's going to take everything that is his father's. This guy, what's his relation here? Remember, we've got another person in this whole thing. <laughs> Who was Bathsheba? Wife, or <clears throat> I don't know what number wife. <laughs> David, yeah. but uh -huh. and mother of Saul. Oh, mother of Saul. Yeah. But yeah, wife of David. Yeah. <laughs> David's, <coughs> David's um, <coughs> wife, whom he committed adultery with, and who will be the, son, the, the mother of Solomon. But this is the, the woman that David kind of had an illegitimate relationship, had an illegitimate son with, who died after birth. And, and she is now a play, and then he married her. <coughs> Ahithophel, if you'll remember, is who? Her nephew or some grand grandfather. This is... Oh. <laughs> grandfather of Bathsheba he has an axe to grind and he grinds it and when David flees Ahithophel goes over to Absalom's side 
to be his royal advisor. So this is, dude, this is like as, you know, this is the, all the intrigue of days of our lives as you can possibly imagine here. This is like a soap <laughs> opera. Was so David's father-in-law is, well, that grandfather. Grandfather-in-law, kinda, yeah. Is that a thing? Sure. Ish. Plus, I mean, when in this text, you know, God wants, you know, he's not happy that they thought if, uh, if the fellow's mm -hmm. advice was the same as the word of God. Yeah. So, like, that plays into it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Who's Joab? Military leader. The Top great guy. general for David. Top general for who? David. David. David, yep. Is there a rela <laughs> family relationship there, too? <laughs> I don't Joab's, is Joab's mother is the sister of David's sister, Abigail, oh. making Joab and, <laughs> let, me, let me say this so I don't get this wrong, okay? Let me say this. Amasa, who takes over for Joab, is the son of David's sister, Abigail, making Amasa the enemy general, David's nephew. She was also the sister of Joab's mother, making Joab and Amasa cousins. The two opposing generals are cousins. Mm. The family tree, folks, <clears throat> is a pole. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very intertwined here, and you can see how, so what does that tell you? This isn't just about business. It's not business, it's personal. This is family against family here, at all levels. Hushai is who? Well, that's David's advice. Yeah. And what did he do? Did he go with David? Well, he kind of uh, went with Absalom in a subversive role. He's undercover, dude. Double agent. Double agent, <laughs> Michael Scarn, Hushai, <laughs> right? Even Google says that. <laughs> he's, he's a spy. Yes! Google finally <laughs> agrees with us for once. Mm -hmm. Who's Jonathan? This is a trick question. It's not Saul's son. No, this that. is not Saul's son. This is the son of the high priest Abiathar, I think. Is he Abiathar's son? Yes. Jonathan is the son of priest <laughs> Abi. And Ahimehaz is the son of the priest Zadok. So this, you can't get any more entangled <laughs> with intrigue than is happening now. And so these are the two, these are the two legitimate priests. And again, um, you know, there's some, there's some word about, you know, is it a high priest? Maybe they, they're co-high priests. It doesn't matter. They're both the priests uh, of the temple. Okay, <laughs> and if that didn't confuse you. But some of these, you know, he's yeah. Obviously, they were all under David, right? Yeah, at one point. And, and now yeah. part of them are under Absalom because mm -hmm. they figured David's going to be out. That's it. And so maybe we can just real quickly show kind of the, you know, <coughs> here's the bad guys. Um, yeah, so it's probably best to show it that way. Um, <coughs> what do you take from, from this chapter? Maybe it's self-evident. <coughs> what, what do you take from this? I kind of have a sense of like reading all this and the turmoil and everything that's going on. It's almost like when Jesus came, he just said, just chill, just relax, just calm down. You know, I mean, everybody's grabbing for power and this person said and that person said, there's this, this sense of everybody's mm -hmm. out for themselves and trying to grab up what they can. And yep. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the uh, servant girl mm -hmm. who hid the two kind of could exemplify, I mean, we could apply that today and, you know, no matter what your role is, mm -hmm. it can still have a level of importance if you're following God and God's will. <clears throat> Totally agree. Just because you're not the the pastor of a megachurch 
doesn't mean you don't have a really critical role to play in serving God's kingdom. Totally, I love that. Maybe you I clean the toilets, <clears throat> and because you clean the toilets well, a visitor comes in and says, huh, this place is sparkling clean. I think I'll come back. That's an interesting analogy, Steve. <laughs> Boy, that was just brilliant. Just I love top that. Of your head, huh? <laughs> <laughs> just bringing it real. <laughs> I love that. Actually, that is, is that true. I did that. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? I, that I don't know. know. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't trying to judge the church. The gospel think, of like, times. When I went in that bathroom, mm -hmm. it was like, oh, these bathrooms are very nice. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it wasn't dirty or anything. I'd have been in some like dirty bathrooms in the church, and I didn't like it. And it made me feel like the people are dirty. I don't know why. Is that judging people? I think it's human, right? Yeah. You know? judging people, though, too. Mm -hmm. But point being, probably, that there is no such thing as a menial job in serving the king. They're all equal. <clears throat> Whether you're preaching the word or you're cleaning the bathrooms, they all are very important roles. So what else do you take from this? I think, well, two things. Like, Absalom, like, well, we'll see later, but also we have seen in the past, too. Like, David... Does, he fled because he doesn't want people to die. Yeah. He Especially later on, <laughs> he doesn't want Absalom to die. His, it's his own son. He doesn't want to kill yes. Absalom. But Absalom has no qualms about going yeah. out and let's go kill my father David. Like, he doesn't care. Loves his son. Folks, <laughs> the ruthless people look at David and say, you're an idiot. The people who have a heart look at David and say, I totally get where you're coming from. He's your son. You love him. You think he's going to be the next king. And I don't know if it was here in the next chapter, he refers to him as the young man Absalom. He, he does that a couple of times. The young, what does that tell you? David's calling him the young, this young man Absalom, how he refers to him. Well, young people are stupid. Yeah? <laughs> the boys will be boys, yeah. Yeah. right? That kind of attitude. Well, kids will be kids. He'll come out of this. Well, he will if he kills you. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a sense there. Of, so David's in position, and it's a lot easier for him to love mm -hmm. from that position than Absalom yeah. is in a position of want. And so love is not part of his equation yet. Maybe, I mean, it could have been someday, maybe. I, it just seems like it's... It's a little easier to love from that. But so I'll, I'll look at my, my own life. I'm, I'm secure in the kingdom of God. Therefore, it makes it a lot easier for me to love than if I was to just still be tr you know, striving to get to some position. Mm -hmm. I'll run over whoever's in my way mm -hmm. to get there. Don't the ends justify the means, though, Ken? Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. A little white lie here and there. It's it's for the good. That's how someone gets hurt. Absalom definitely doesn't have a... <laughs> you can tell not, my sarcasm, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's not ready to wait for God's timing. Like, I think ah. David, you know, thinks that Absalom <clears throat> will be the next king. He doesn't know, as far as we know. And, but Absalom obviously is not seeking God's counsel in any of this. Okay, I love it. But I'm sure Absalom thinks that he's, you know, he's going to be a better ruler than they yeah. So, I mean, you know, it would make sense that he should become king sooner rather than wait because look at all the good stuff he's got in planned out. Yep, yep, yep. I think it says in the next chapter mm -hmm. about David would just soon be, would rather die than have Absalom. Yeah. And again, what does that say about David's heart <laughs> here, you know? Well, I think we do give David, I don't know, like he's kind of like a bad father because yeah. his, his, you know, he has all these wives, all these children, and, you know, he has all this contention in his house, but then he does love, I mean, this part does show his love for his, you know. Children, he loves so. his kids, but he's done a horrible job raising them. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he is a bad father. Yeah. That's true. I mean, let's, yeah. be, let's just say, you know, and it, it depends on how you de define bad father. Absent. He was, say it again. Probably somewhat absent. I mean, he's yeah. the king, he's got a lot of kids. Yeah. I mean, there's not a way for him to be there all the time. Right. <coughs> that's, that's women's work anyway, right? 
Well, you know, we, I have a wet nurse for that, right? I've got an assistant. I've got a, you know, an au pair to take yeah. care of my kids. I got bigger I'm not things today. I, mean, I, don't, I don't agree with that, yeah. but in the day, that was the thing. 20 wives and how many kids? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, and it even says in the narrative, there, there would be periods where he wouldn't see his kids for months or years. Imagine that. Imagine that. Um, but he does have a heart. And again, this, this is a tangent. The outcome versus his heart for his kids. He does love them, but you know, it's, it's in his response that it, it matters. I think um, the other thing about this passage, mm -hmm. when like Ahithophel, mm -hmm. that he's like, oh, you didn't accept my advice. I'm going to go home. Why did he do that? Set my affairs in order and then kill myself. Why did he do that? Was this just he, he, his feelings were hurt? That can't be the first time someone said you're full of crap. Everyone gets told they're full of crap. I don't know. He seems like he's never had anyone disagree with him. He's going to be exposed. No longer will be asked for advice, for advice from him. Okay. But if he was as wise as they think he was, yeah. I think that he knew if they don't accept my advice, God's against me and it's over. That's, I think that's what we're heading for, is that this guy is smart enough to see the writing on the wall. And he sees this other guy's advice and he's like, oh crap. Maybe things aren't going to turn out the way I want. Now, if you're Hehithophel, what happens if Absalom loses? Well, you'll be killed probably. David's compassion for sparing life only extends <laughs> to his blood. Right. And, and to Saul's family blood. If you're anyone else, you're in trouble. Because he knows this is how it works. You, you get it. Well, He's he like, probably wouldn't just go after a hippothel. He'd probably go to his family too and wipe out that whole line. Maybe. Maybe. Or, or his soldiers would do it. Remember, we're right. in a time where soldiers kind of do their own thing, thinking they're going to get rewarded for it. So, yep. Yep, yep. He okay. does sound pouty, though, when you read it. He's so pouty, dude. <laughs> it's like, I bet in the Hebrew it's worse. Let's do, uh, let's do 18. Let's go on. And, and again, we're kind of artificially breaking these up because of, of time, and I only have an hour uh, a week. Um, really, you could kind of read the second half of Samuel in an afternoon, uh, really, to get the full impact from it. We're, we're kind of breaking it up. Let's do chapter 18, the whole thing. Who would like to do that for me? I can do it. Thanks. So David counted his men and placed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He sent the troops out of three groups. Joab commanded one-third of the men. Joab's brother, Abishai, son of Zeruah, commanded another third. And Itai from Gath commanded the last third. King David said to them, I will also go with you. But the men said, you must not go with us. If we run away into the, in the battle, Absalom's men won't care. Even if half of us are killed, Absalom's men won't care. But you're worth 10,000 of us. You can help us most by staying in the city. The king said to his people, I will do what you think is best. So the king stood at the side of the gate as the army went out in groups of a hundred and a thousand. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Itai, be gentle with young Absalom for my sake. Everyone heard the king's orders to the commanders about Absalom. David's army went out into the field against Absalom's Israelites, and they fought it in the forest of Ephraim. There David's army defeated the Israelites. Many died that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread through all the country, but that day more men died in the forest than in the fighting. Then Absalom happened to meet David's troops. As Absalom was riding his mule, it went under thick branches of a large oak tree. Absalom's head got caught in the tree and his mule ran out from under him. So Absalom was left hanging above the ground. When one of the men saw it happen, he told Joab, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Joab said to him, you saw him? Why didn't you kill him and let him fall to the ground? I would have given you a belt and four ounces of silver. The man answered, I wouldn't touch the king's son, even if you gave me 25 pounds of silver. We heard the king command you, Abishai and Aitai, be careful not to hurt young Absalom. If I had killed him, the king would have found out and you would not have protected me. So Joab <laughs> said, I won't waste time here with you. Absalom was still alive in the oak tree, so Joab took three spears and he stabbed him in the heart. Ten young men who carried Joab's armor also gathered around Absalom and struck him and killed him. 
Then Joab took the trumpet, so the troops stopped chasing the Israelites. Then Joab's men took Absalom's body and threw it into a large pit in the forest and filled the pit in with many stones. All the Israelites ran away to their homes. When Absalom was alive, he had set up a pillar for himself in the king's valley. He said, I have no son to keep my name alive. So he named the pillar after himself, and he called it Absalom's monument even today. And Hiraz, son of Zadok, said to, Jacob, or said to Joab, let me run and take the news to King David. I will tell him that the Lord has saved him from his enemies. Joab said to Ahimez, No, you are not the one to take the news today. You may do it another time, but do not take it today because the king's son is dead. So then Joab said to a man from Cush, Go tell the king what you have seen. And the Cushite bowed to Joab and ran to tell David. But Ahimez, son of Zadok, begged Joab again, No matter what happens, please let me go along with the Cushite. Joab said, Son, why do you want to carry the news? You won't get any reward. Ahimez answered, no matter what happens, I will run. So Joab said to Ahimez, run. Then Ahimez ran by the way of the Jordan Valley and passed the Cushite. David was sitting between the inner and outer gates of the city. The watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the walls, and as he looked up, he saw a man running alone. He shouted the news to the king. The king said, if he is alone, he is bringing good news. The man came nearer and nearer to the city. Then the watchman saw another man running, and he called to the gatekeeper, Look, another man is running alone. The king said, He is also bringing good news. The watchman said, I think the first man runs like Ahimez, son of Zadok. <laughs> the king said, Ahimez is a good man. He must be bringing good news. Then Ahimez called a greeting to the king. He bowed face down on the ground before the king and said, Praise the Lord your God. The Lord has defeated those who were, you, who were against you, my, my king. The king said, or the king asked, Is young Absalom all right? Ahimez answered, when Joab sent me, I saw some great excitement, but I don't know what it was. The king said, step over here and wait. So Ahimez stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived. He said, master and king, hear the good news. Today the Lord has punished those who were against you. The king asked the Cushite, is young Absalom all right? And the Cushite answered, may your enemies and all who have come to hurt you be like that young man. Then the king was very upset, and he went to the room over the city gate and cried. As he went... He cried out, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, I wish I had died and not you. Absalom, my son, my son. Thank you. Reactions. <laughs> Joab Joab really likes to do things his own way, doesn't he? Oh yeah, <laughs> this is a man of action. Yeah. It's like, you, you just stay here, I'll take care of this. <laughs> <laughs> Not one javelin. Joab is much more Three. like us than yeah. David is. <laughs> Joab's kind of like, I don't know, in a weird way. He's, he's kind of like um, Paul, I think. He's kind of, he knows what he's going to do and he's going to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. He's a man of action. Maybe he doesn't plunge javelins into people's hearts. Yeah. Doesn't matter <clears throat> how many times David reveals his character, nobody, nobody gets it. Yeah. Nobody understands. They're like, this is, I'm sure this is what he would want us to do. I think Joab knew. And I think Joab knew because he didn't want this other guy to go running ahead to tell him. He's like, you better stay here because he's going to be pissed. <laughs> but I, I, I agree in some way. Maybe it's not rubbing off on them. <laughs> yeah. I like that this other guy, one of the other man, they don't say who he is, but mm -hmm. that he's like, you, the Joab's like, you saw him? Why did you kill him? And this guy's like, I... I know what has happened in the past. See? Steve, he's like, Steve got, got it. This guy got it. <laughs> he's like, I'm not going to kill. Get my head cut off of this. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Yeah, some, some get it and some just yeah. don't. And some probably get it and still act yeah. more, more towards the position of the king than, you know, mm -hmm. than what is really in his heart. Mm -hmm. Like, like nah, he'll be okay if we, you know, kill him for the sake of... David's kingship. I mean, let's be honest, just because David doesn't want Absalom dead, does that mean that's God's wish? I mean, let's be honest here. That doesn't mean that he's right. I think, I think David probably had some guilt going on. I mean, Nathan came and told him, hey, your sons are going to rebel against you because of your evil deeds. Mm -hmm. So now David's thinking, okay, how do I control this? Yeah. Don't hurt Absalom. And it's well, now that he's killed, it's, this it's is it. David bears responsibility for that. I like did, that. Did David know that his <clears throat> that his line would rule? 
continue to rule forever because it says here that Absalom didn't have any sons. So that was the end of the line. If Absalom became king, that would be the end of the line. Mm -hmm. Did David know that? Well, I mean, he could have, you know, again, maybe Absalom remarries. I don't know. Um, after David is gone. Um, Absalom is noted to have children in the narrative earlier, but when he says, I don't have any sons, what does that say to you about what happened to those three boys? Died. They're gone. They're dead. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, too, how David kind of has snapped out of his yeah. state of depression and, you know, took command of the army and took over. And, you know, suddenly it's like David came alive in this chapter. Mm. Okay. Didn't somebody tell him, though? You need to act like king, in a sense? That's what you said. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, he's had several instances of people coming to him and telling him stories, mm -hmm. you know, that convict him. Like, guess what? You're the guy, the bad guy in this story. You need to shape up. Absalom's tomb. Who's heard of Absalom's tomb? It's real. Yeah. Well, it's a tomb they say is Absalom's tomb. Narrative says that he was buried in the forest of Ephraim. Okay, where is that? Someone point to it. We, we don't know. That's, that's the thing. So <laughs> it's thought that it's Transjordan somewhere. It's not entirely clear where. 3,000 years ago, it may have been heavily forested. There are some trees in this area now, but it's a little, it's a little drier now. And of course, you know, trees are the first to go. Um, it sounds like a lot of this is happening in this side of the Jordan. Um, but we're not entirely sure where all these places. It says Absalom was buried in a hole in the ground and covered with rocks in the forest of Ephraim. Um, there is a tomb of Absalom in Jerusalem. In fact, um, <clears throat> okay, so this is our this is our blown up view. This is uh, this is the temple. Okay, um, this is the Kidron Valley. Okay, so here's the temple. Here is um, here is that southern valley. Here's the Mount of Olives. Absalom's tomb is right here, <laughs> right there. Um, what is thought to be now a first century AD um, expansion of the tomb is sitting here, but the, the Jews have a tradition of taking uh, things like when passing by spitting on it, <laughs> um, taking their children there to you know, give them a lesson about you know, being a bad uh, bad king and, and subverting God and this and that. So it's there and you can go and you can visit it if you visit that. So this is kind of like the, the Hebrew version of who's buried in Grant's tomb. Oh, this is <laughs> <laughs> Only theirs is more of a mystery than, right. than ours. Right. It's funny that they took the time to like bury him. Whereas like Saul and like, I don't know, other people who have died that are of note, they mm -hmm. haven't like taking the time to bury them. Oh, the I people of Jabesh Gilead came and took Saul and buried him, but yeah. Well, uh, that like right away after mm -hmm. he was dead. Like, when they could get to him, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I wondered if they weren't trying to cover up the evidence. You know, Joab knew he shouldn't have killed mm -hmm. him, but mm -hmm. he did. Maybe it's don't show the king the body of his son or else things could get really out of whack. Well, well let's, he, let's the, pile some rocks here so just in case he wants somebody. Went, yeah, he's, he's right here. Yeah. Wink. Well, because yeah. he didn't just stab him once. He took three spears and stabbed him in the heart, and then ten young men were he's stabbing like, him. Okay, go to work, guys. So I find yeah. it looks so good. It's not like you took it. It's not going to be pretty. No. What's yeah. Absalom doing on a mule? Okay, unless so... A mule, unless yeah. a mule it just means yeah. an animal it could be a horse. <clears throat> a mule, you're not going to go too fast if you're trying to get away from people. It's, it's interesting because horses were primarily used for chariots of the period and for work horses. Donkeys and mules were the animals to carry kings. And it's, uh, it's a complicated story, but that tended to be what rulers rode on, not horses. <clears throat> but a mule is more of a a bigger animal. It's not like a it's donkey. It's not a donkey. I mean, yeah. if you've seen a mule, it kind of looks like a horse. Yeah. So he's not, you know, he's kind not down here. <laughs> Multifunctional. Exactly. Fast and wild. Well, a mule is a cross between a donkey and a it's horse. It's a hybrid. And if you paint stripes, it's a zebra. <laughs> <laughs> I found it interesting that. So then David numbered the people who were with him and set over them commanders. Yeah. So what's that process look like? 
just to go, okay, who's with me? You say, yeah. Know? I mean, what does it tell you about the size of his force? Now remember, when he was fleeing from Saul, his force seemed to be about what? Is that 600 ish? It, it was a few hundred. Now we've got people who are commanders over. Thousands. So he, he's definitely got a sizable part of the army has stuck with him here. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, is it just whoever's still here is still with me? Because everybody else mm -hmm. went somewhere else? Or, I mean, it's not like you can take a poll and a little different back mm -hmm. in those days. Mm -hmm. I just found that kind of like, is that a, you know, a week long process? Is that something that happened overnight? Is that? If he's doing that, you know, think about it too from the author's perspective. The author of this narrative maybe is trying to make what case? If David is the one doing this, not this guy. What is, what is that saying about David? David ultimately is in control of his army. He's in control. And, it, you know, what is the process? I don't know. It's a very good question. I think the author is trying to say, but David is still the guy in charge. Remember, we've seen, oh, look what Joab just did, right? You know, we've seen cases where the generals kind of take over and they do their own thing. Well, guess who's in charge when the general takes over and wins the battle? The, the general. Yeah. He, he's the guy now. We kind of come back to your missing highlights in your Bible, too, with yes. this, too. At no point did either side consult God that Thank we you. know of. Yes. And so what does that tell you? I guess what's concerning a little bit is that, okay, yeah, David was granted victory, but it seems like they're kind of doing it on their own. Yeah. You know, yep. Joab is going to take credit for being the great <clears throat> general. David's mm -hmm. going to is taking credit for being a wise king. Nobody's giving credit to God mm -hmm. or seeking his advice before him. Except for the writer that said the Lord had ordained to thwart the good counsel of Ahithophel back in 1714. Mm -hmm. So when he was, when Ahithophel gave this advice and then the other guy, whatever his name was, came in and gave the other advice was to was to go against was so that push I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that's the only evidence of God. Like yeah, what God wanted. At he's the, still yeah. working. He's yeah. still behind the scenes. Well, what does it suggest if you're one of these guys and you know this? Why aren't you asking God? They all have their own you're own not going to like the answer. Why do we go to God and ask him? Do you really want me to get this job or this promotion? What are you afraid of if you don't ask him? <laughs> no. You, you might say no. Yes. Well, crap, I didn't want that answer. And if he says it, then it's official. Right. It's easier to ask for forgiveness yeah. than permission. Well, you didn't actually say I wasn't supposed to get this job, so I went and applied for it. Well, I think God is shown in like this Absalom thing because like how what are the odds that you're going to go under a tree and your head is going to get stuck <laughs> in a tree? Why do we think his head got stuck? Do you remember way back? His flowing locks. Beautiful flowing locks like Fabio. <laughs> we made the comments. And all of the people under 45 said, who's Fabio? <laughs> uh, beautiful, luxurious locks. It gets them caught in a tree. Yeah. So, I mean, like, I think that's, I mean, God wanted... Yeah, to stop this from, I think. I think that's that's a real weird thing to happen. I think God had to. You can't say that happens a whole lot in the Bible. <laughs> Your hair caught in a tree. Yeah. And then he's just hanging there. Like, he can't get out. Yeah. <laughs> he's just he didn't have any men around who could cut yeah. him loose, or he had right. a knife on him to. Chalk that one up for interesting stories of the Bible, it's like right? It's just like a target. Just yeah. hanging there. Mm -hmm. Pinata. <laughs> yes, it's, it's <laughs> really weird. Except no candy comes out. I don't get any candy out of it. <laughs> um, okay. Mm -hmm. What else? What other? What, what else are you taking from this? Why does Ahimez want to do the telling so much, and then when he gets there, he doesn't actually? He doesn't really have it. anything to say. He actually lies and says, well, I don't really know what happened. What's that about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wanted to tell of the great victory, but he didn't want to tell of the cost of that victory. Look, who, who doesn't want to get patted on the back by their boss for good news, mm -hmm. you know, and get in their favor? And Joab's like, shut up. Don't do it. I'm going to do it. 
Joab probably thought, okay, this guy, this is the last time I'll ever see him alive, right? Okay. <laughs> maybe, Get your head, man. maybe he had a change of heart when he got there. He's like, okay, I don't remember what happened. Yeah, it's funny. He says, you know, he sends the Ethiopian. Yeah. The, uh huh. The guy he doesn't care about. You go tell the king. I noticed that. I noticed that. Because a lot of yep. times the people who told the king bad news. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that. And to some degree, maybe this this fellow has, you know, obviously he's got a little more of a of a relationship with the king, and he wants to protect him from that. Um, yeah. What's the What's the position of David sitting between the two gates? Is there any? So he's taken up residence in this town, which again we're not exactly sure where this town is. Um, <clears throat> remember what I told you about the the city plan of cities in antiquity. You would have a city surrounded by a wall, almost always surrounded by a wall after about, let's say 2500 BC, give or take, in the Near East. Before, interestingly, before that, most cities did not have walls. What does that tell you about the, the, the kind of society at the time? It's more nomadic. Peaceful. It's peaceful and nomadic. They weren't <laughs> under threat that they were gonna be attacked, but around 2500 BC in the Near East, almost all of a sudden overnight, cities start to have walls. That tells you what? Fighting. Afraid, yeah, they're coming. They're coming to attack us. So the city would have a wall, but they would not have just one wall, they would have this gate. So you would come in here, and again, you know, um, you would have a single, uh, you know, in general, you would have this one major entrance for the city, over time that changes. You would have this one place here where you would have, this is the city, and this is a courtyard. And it's called a courtyard for a very good reason. <clears throat> and you would have the, the uh, outer gate, and you have the inner gate. What is the military reason for having two gates and a courtyard? Militarily speaking. If you can break through one, one door, yeah. Then at least you have a second door that you can fall back on. Um, you kind of and you have some time. You bite some yes. time too. You trap them. You've got them in a in a strategically important, like superior. And if your husband was here, he could tell us all about what this means. Um, it, this is usually the easiest way into the city. Usually the city was built so it would be like on a hill or something. So usually this would slope away. Um, there might be water around it, you know, like the moat kind of thing. So this was the easiest way in. So they'd have to come in here. This was a good way to trap them <coughs> and kill them if they did make it through the first wall. What would happen though, is that when there was times of peace, the king or the priest or the ruler of the city or the judges would come out to here. This is where all of the kind of the business of the city takes place. We talk about city hall today, right? That's where you go to get your, you know, your driver's license or to get your voter registration or to you know, go, to, go to court or what have you. That all happened right here. The important people of the city would come to the to the courtyard because why? They don't want you coming to their place. <laughs> They'll come to you. And all of the merchants were coming and going through here during the day, during the night, the, the, the doors were always closed. You didn't, you didn't come and go at night. During the day, the soldiers would all be stationed around here. There'd be soldiers everywhere. All the people were coming and going, all the animals, the business was being transacted. The judges would come to this double uh, you know, gated area called the courtyard and hold court. And this is where the important people of the city would sit and, and pronounce judgments and decisions for the, for the people. So that's why he was sitting there. They recognized him as the leader. That was a long-winded explanation. Okay. Any final thoughts before we go on? We're getting to the end here. I think we only have three more weeks um, before we wrap it up and you can kind of see where this is all going. Any final thoughts here for Samuel? I think when we're done, this is, this is kind of the plan for the spring. So, so at least at this point, um, Dan is thinking about covering Hebrews in the main service for a few weeks starting after Easter. So the week after Easter, at least this is the plan, he's gonna go through a study of the book of Hebrews. He and I were thinking, maybe this is a great chance for us to kind of pair up and tag team on teaching. So, at least right now the plan is, the week after Easter, I will start teaching Hebrews, deep dive, and he will be covering it as kind of a, a high level in the, in the main service. To get to that, we'll have a few weeks of a gap. And so what I thought I would do is do the book of James in the, in the New mm -hmm. Testament. Probably, I, yeah, one of my favorites, and I'm glad I see virtual applause there, that's awesome. Hopefully you like that. 
Um, James is so rich, like my wife said this morning, you could probably do two weeks per chapter. Um, we'll try and do one chapter a week. There's a lot in it. Uh, maybe I would encourage you between now and you know about you know four weeks from now to start studying James. There's a lot to it to unpack. Um, and then we'll go through that, and I think it's five chapters. Um, we'll go through James, and then we'll start Hebrews in April. So does that sound cool? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. I was hoping for Ecclesiastes, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I figured if I wanted an audience, I better not do that. So. Thanks, brother. Lamentations. That's right. All right, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Yeah.